Hello. <clears throat> Hello, hello, hello. There she is. There she is. There they are. There and they and good morning. Good afternoon, Yavi. Good afternoon, Avani. Good afternoon, Amanda. Good afternoon, Cheska. They, all right. Good. Oh, and wow, they're like ready to go. They're like so ready. They're going to make such a good class next semester when they totally don't take this. Okay. Oh, good afternoon, Yavi. Good afternoon, Avani. Good afternoon, Marilyn. Good afternoon, Amanda. Good afternoon, Freddie. Good afternoon, Matthew. Shirley. Wait, Shirley. Wait, is that in response? Shirley, Shirley next semester? You mean? Wait, okay. Shirley, you're joking, Mr. Feynman? Stop calling me Shirley. What? Okay. Okay. Um... I think I get it. Okay. All right. So we're going to start. Um, all right. The emojis, I understand. Okay. The evolution of emoji. Um, I wonder if natural, the survival of the fittest and natural selection apply to like emojis? Like, all right. Anyway. All right. Let's get, let's do physics. Um, bro. Whoops. My bad. We, this, okay. Okay. Uh, who, uh, sh uh, oh, someone just came. Okay. 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 How well do I know my Pokemon? That's a great. Well, it depends what serious question. Well, actually, I, that is a serious question. I mean, okay, be careful. We have a lot of physics to do. Today. I got to be very careful. I mean, here's the thing. I'd love to talk about this in my office someday. Here's the thing. Like certain aspects of Pokemon, I know very. Uh, it depends on you because I play the card game. I mean, I play TCG with my son. So, like, I know, I know, like, certain generations very well, like the Scarlet Violet generation, I know pretty well, Sword and Shield generation very, very well. Oh, 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 really? Okay, okay. So I'm over. Whoa. Oh, yeah. Jigglypuff, right? Evolves into Wigglytuff. Am I right? I mean, yeah. All right. I mean, good. Phew, phew. Oh, I love Jigglypuff. Who doesn't love Jigglypuff? And who doesn't love the fact that he evolves into? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna very precious. <laughs> All right, no, I'm gonna leave. Uh, we can continue with physics. Oh God, I'm gonna miss this class. I wow, I my professor fell asleep again. Oh, your count professor. Oh my God, I need to make a portal for you. Just like literally asked me a question that I could answer correctly. That felt so good. All right, no, I don't think I could do it. Thank you for it. It was a setup, folks. She, I paid her twenty dollars to ask a Pokemon that I actually would know, but no, oh, okay. Sorry, that was so satisfying. I don't even know what to do with myself. Now. Okay. Um, um, okay. But we, for what it's worth, no, I'm not going to see. I mean, and a stuffy, but you know what? I don't think my son has one. Okay, I can't stop. We have so many Pokemon, whatever you call them, stuffies or loveys or whatever in this house, like so many, but I don't think we have that one. We have a Snorlax that's like the size of Santa Claus. Um, And Snorlax is obviously like a sleeping Pokemon, but all right. Anyway, plushies. Right. That's it. Plushies. Yes, yes, yes. There should be a, there should be a portal for him. Maybe I will do Wait, what's my favorite? There's a correct answer. Wait, that's not fair. Wait. Okay. Sorry. 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 During an exam, he fell asleep. Okay. Wait, I, you guys, there's so much physics to do. This is not fair. This class is very good at doing this. Um. Wait, my favorite starter. Well, I mean, that, no, that's not a fair question. I mean, of all time or like, I mean, I mean, Cause in 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 Scarlet, we're in Scarlet Violet now, and I love Sprigatito. Like I'm usually I'm a little partial to the grass starters, but not fair question, not fair question, because it's like too much. And obviously, some of the classic water ones are so cute. I mean, please don't do this to me. You can't. But right now, I'm into Sprigatito because Sprigatito evolves into Florigato, which evolves into a Meow Scarada, and Meow Scarada is the coolest ever. Really, I mean, a Spanish magic cat. You cannot not love a Spanish magic hat. I'm just saying, okay, I need to, I need to retire. Sorry. Um, okay, okay, wait, 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 wait. But I know that's not the right answer that Amanda's looking for. I know, I know. It was from Dave and Busters. Oh my God, I should not be reading the chat. Guys, the chat is becoming like, I don't get it. What are we doing? Good question, Chris. No, you're right. All right, I'm going talking. Stop it. Stop. How does a cat speak Spanish? I mean, I, how does a cat not speak Spanish? Um. Okay, there is no correct answer. 
Good. Okay. That's good, Amanda. You're right. There's no correct. Right. Because everybody has to be a winner when it comes to that. It's the whole point. It's like, do you like rock or paper or scissors better? Okay. Stop. Everybody stop. Okay. How do you do this to me? You're not even, like in a Zoom. The fact that you guys can do this is true. All right. Back to physics. Wait. No, stop. Chris, you can't do that. You. If I had to be a put. Oh, God. Literally. Oh, now he's using his voice too. Wait, what? What did you say? Put it in the chat. You put it. No, I see it in the chat. It's. I mean, you're a professor. You have to like answer it, though. I I, I know. I because I because it's in the chat. Right. Also, just for the record, when I just lost my coolest, I like, know literally the dog upstairs is now barking. What? Like the dog is upset because I just got to. Okay. Let um, me see the dog. Uh, well, I'm sure you will at some point, but. Actually, probably the dog is upset because we're talking about cats now that I think about it. But um, yes, Scarlet Show. Oh, wait, what? Wait, what happened? Picture of the dog. Uh, oh my God! Whoa, we just got Michelle in it. If because uh, just because it's Michelle asking, I like I almost have to. I almost have to say yes. I do have a picture of the dog. I don't think I could put it in the chat right now, guys. This is too much. I will. And in fact, oh my God, I. This just came up the other day, too, with the CLT. I'll get back to you with a picture of the dog, I promise. I will. It is a cute dog. But uh, I, I can guys, like, we're almost at final exam. Um, but, yes, Scarlet and Violet is, that is true. It is basically supposed to be Spain. Just, like, like every every re Pokemon region is, like, really based on a real region of the world. And, yes, totally, the new one is, like, Spain. That is totally true. Okay, wait, guys. <laughs> this is not fair because I could... I mean, some come by my, okay, this is just not fair. Uh, show us the dog or else. Okay, that's funny. This is all very funny. As you can tell, I can't beg, but, I, but, you know, literally, it's now you have a choice between calculus professors who like literally fall asleep or physics professors who like just talk about Pokemon. I mean, you somewhere, someone's got to get their money's worth at this college. This is far more entertaining. <laughs> well, professor. My cop professor fell asleep during an exam, which is crazy. I mean, well, was he, I mean, was he taking the exam? I mean, what's he supposed to, okay. I'm not, that his, is, excuse, his excuse was that he went to a wedding and he came home early in the morning. All right. I cannot, I'm certainly not going to talk. If I have to choose, I would rather talk about Pokemon than take a professor's name in vain. But wait, do I get 110? Fair. Wait, thank you. Wait, but. Pokemon, oh my God, you guys, I, I can't believe none of you are taking physics at eight in the morning next year. Like, it's so disappointing to me. Um, Okay. Um, I would, but it doesn't work with my schedule. I know, I understand. I do feel, and I don't want to get into this now. I really do feel bad about it. I know it's, it, it's not on purpose. It's not to keep people away, but it does have that impact and it makes me sad. And it's, a, well, I mean, I am, I am teaching at 12 of team, but online, I, I can't, for variety, I, and it's too late to change the schedule for next semester anyway. But anyway, I, and I do feel bad about that. I mean, we should get back to physics now. Um, but um, you are a very good group. I can't deny it. Um, of course, it's also going on recording. So I'm not going to say that you're my favorite because, uh, you know, it's recorded. But um, but maybe you are. Uh, wait, but what you also, wait, what, there was a serious thing. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, and I'm not going to talk about it. Enough. I I will say, for what it's worth, the professor that you're talking about right now, where he went to cop, he, no, I'm not going to get into this, but the one of the only physics textbooks that I still think is like of serious, serious value for physics at this level is written by a bunch of people at RPI, which is where your professor went. As a, I mean, he had the as professors, he had the professors that wrote our physics textbook. Like, but I, I mean, he, I mean, he is very, very educated. You're, you're, I'm just saying, but all right, we'll go back. All right, let's go back. He, I mean, he is, uh, Ch okay. Cheska's question is like vaguely almost serious, I think. So yeah, yeah. Next semester 204 online is at 1215. That is true. There is also a section at 305 that I, do, I don't think I'm teaching next semester to, I mean, to be blunt or to be like, just to give you that information, but yeah, there's a 305 online section. There's a 1215 online section next semester. And, and then there's the eight in the morning, which of course I highly, which is in person, but of course is eight in the morning, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. All right. All right. We do have to get going here. Um, But yes, this was very entertaining and I'll talk about Pokemon at any time and it's not a paid advertisement. Um, Okay. 
Uh, this is where we were yesterday. I mean, last class. Um, let me summarize. Like what we're trying to do. Now, this is a little bit tricky. And again, like we said last class, we're getting into the calculus issues now. Um, what we're defining is a physics concept, the physics concept of work. Okay. What we have so far based on Monday is we have a definition for a little bit of work. We have a definition right now for what it means to do work over a small amount of displacement. What do I mean? A small but finite amount of displacement. What do I mean by small? I mean small enough that the force being applied does not have room to change, right? So if you have a small amount of displacement and, and a force acting through that displacement, work is defined to be, for that situation, the dot product, the scalar product of force times displacement, right? So example, like example in the middle of this page here, if you, you're pushing a box across a table and you're pushing the, then in simple terms, the work you do on the box is the amount of Newtons that you're pushing with times the amount of meters that the box moves. Like work is the effect, the accumulated effect of force throughout some interval of space. Like that's what the concept is, is how, how hard you push or pull throughout some interval of space. Um, that's the concept. But now there's like details to this concept. The first detail that I was trying to say on Monday is that, is that force is a vector and displacement is a vector. Each measurement involves not only size, but also direction, right? So when we say that work is the product of force times displacement, when we say that one joule of work is one Newton of force times one meter of displacement, we're actually asking ourselves to multiply two quantities together that are vector quantities. So we have to take a step back last Monday and acknowledge, wait a second, there's like different ways that multiplication can occur when vectors are involved. And specifically, when you do vectors and you want to multiply them together, you've got two choices in life, in physics, in general, in math, in general. If you've got two vectors and you want to multiply them together, you've got two choices. You can multiply them together in a manner that produces a scalar quantity, a non-vector, a pure number, or you can multiply the two vectors together in a manner that produces a vector, a quantity of magnitude and direction. Now, the first choice, multiplying two vectors together in order to produce a scalar, some people call that the scalar product, many people call it the dot product. The other choice, when you multiply vectors together to make a vector, is called a cross product. Now, to be clear, I'm, I'm like, like laying all this out because both of those choices are, both those tools are very important in math and physics. They're both equally super important in math and physics. The, of the two choices of the dot product versus the cross product, the one that we're dealing with here is the dot product. Work, work is the dot product of force with displacement. Um, um, so it means that we're multiplying the force vector by the displacement vector in a manner that wants to ultimately not um, uh, uh, produce a directional quantity. Like, so how does that work? What, how can you do that? How can you multiply two vectors together and just get a pure number? Well, how it works is that you multiply the magnitude of one vector by the magnitude of the other vector by the cosine of the angle between them, right? And that's what it's saying up here in the second line of this sheet, it's saying, Delta W triple equal sign F delta X cosine theta. Uh, like right there, what I'm just doing is I'm expanding, I'm defining what it means to, I'm, I'm saying that a dot product in general, a dot, a scalar product between two vectors in general, the scalar product of vector A times vector B in general equals the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them. Now, why the cosine? I know I was saying this yesterday, I'm just quickly reviewing. Why the cosine? Because the cosine of zero is one and the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. 
In other words, cosine gets smaller and smaller as two, as an angle gets bigger and bigger. Cosine is biggest value. It returns 100%, like the number one. Um, it's its biggest value when, 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 when two lines are parallel with each other, when two, in this case, two vectors are parallel with each other. So, so what the, what the dot product is doing by, by incorporating the cosine, the dot product is really multiplying the extent to which two vectors don't differ in direction. It's multiplying the, or measuring the extent to which two vectors are parallel with each other. In other words, it's taking two vectors and measuring the extent to which we could regard them as two, simply two numbers on a number line and thereby just produce a numerical answer. Okay, so one last way to, so, so in other words, you multiply the magnitude of one vector times the magnitude of the other, and then you multiply by a fraction, a fraction, and the fraction will be, zero if the two vectors are perpendicular with each other, the fraction will be bigger and bigger as the two vectors get closer and closer together, and the fraction will be fully one if the two vectors are exactly lined up with each other, right? So it's you're like, like you're multiplying by like a percentage that indicates how parallel they are. The other way to look at it, or the other way to understand why cosine's involved is to remember that multiplication is commutative that I'm writing F delta X cosine theta here on the page, but I could just as easily have written F cosine theta times delta X. And if I write it that way, you might be able to see from my diagram that if we have this case here where we we're, where a mass is being pushed across a horizontal table, but we're pushing it at an angle, or we could have been pulling it at an angle, whatever, but we're pushing it at some angle theta, like our force is, is 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 slanted is um is displaced from the horizontal by some angle theta then if we zoom in on that vector f on that force vector if we zoom in on it and do the thing we've been sort of doing all semester we can break f into components and realize that the horizontal component of f the component of F that matches the displacement the component of F that's actually getting something done that's actually accomplishing this horizontal displacement of the box, the component of F that is horizontal is F cosine theta. So when I say that for this little example, this example of, for a little bit of displacement, that this example of work would be F cosine theta times delta X, which is what I'm saying. I'm saying that's what the dot product boils down to. I'm saying in the end of the day that work is the product of the parallel components of force and displacement. We don't care what force you're exerting that isn't actually contributing to you, the, the accomplishment of your task. We care about how hard you're pulling or pushing in the direction that you're getting something to go. Okay, so... That's supposed to be like review or refresher or expansion of what we mean whenever we have that dot between the vector F and the, and the vector delta X and the vector X. The dot means literally take the magnitude of one vector times the magnitude of the other and, and then multiply by the cosine and angle between them. Okay, and then you'll notice that, oh, so, so that is all what I've just provided is a definition of delta W. All of what I just said is explaining how you would calculate the, little bit of work that would be done if a force were exerted over a little bit of displacement, a small but finite amount of displacement known as delta X, right? And again, we said, yeah, now this is restriction on my definition. Like it's not a full definition of work yet. I have to build up from this to a generalized definition of work that will work in all cases, no matter how big the displacement is. This is the restrictive case where the displacement is finite but small. And I said yesterday, like, what do I mean by small? Like, what small is a relative term? It certainly is a relative term. What I mean by small in this case is small enough that I could rely on one value of F remaining steady. If you know what F is, you just multiply that F by the delta X in this dot product E way, and you're done. You've got the work. 
that was done on say the box. But the big question now I have to move to today is like, well, okay, so fine. So, but what if we, what do we do if the Delta X like starts getting large enough that the F value starts changing? What do you do if you have different values of X? Excuse me. What do you do if you have different values of F? Good question. Okay, so that's what this says. Okay, so it says, what if delta X is large enough to allow for a varying F? Okay, then, let me just change the view on the screen. Okay, um, then, then in a way what we do is so simple that it has like everything in physics. It's like so simple that it almost doesn't seem worth saying, but it totally is worth saying. What we say is that the whole is equal to the sum of its parts. We say, look, as long as we know how to calculate work for a small amount of displacement where we have a given F value, then if you have a big displacement where you have lots of different F values, what you do to get the big total amount of work is just divide your big displacement into a bunch of smaller segments, like narrow it down, zoom down until you have a bunch of, of equally sized segments, each of which has a clear F value associated with it, right? Like, like in a way, duh. So in other words, if I was pushing this box, but for the first meter, it had an F value of 10 newtons. And then in the second meter, it had an F value of 20 newtons. And then in the third meter, there was an F value of 30 newtons, et cetera, et cetera. Then literally I would just say, okay, in the I would just do it one piece at a time. I would say the, the, the work done for the first meter is 10 times one. And I'd like put it in my pocket, that value, that product I would put in my pocket. Then I'll go to the next meter and I'd say, oh, here now it's 20 times one or like whatever my intervals are. 20 times one, take that, put it in my pocket. Then I go to the next, take that value. And I would just add, walk through the whole displacement and add up, right? So I would say the total work, remember, I'm, remember every time you see a delta on this page over here, like notice even over here, I said delta W equals F delta X cosine theta, et cetera, et cetera. Every time you see a delta, that's supposed to mean a small but finite difference, right? Small but finite. So if I want the big total amount of work, it's the sum of all the small little works. So it would be the sum of F1 times delta X plus F2 times delta X, et cetera, right? Like duh. The whole is equal to, the, I'm not trying to trick you, but I'm trying to break down the concept. The whole would be equal to the sum of its parts. And just notice one subtlety in the way that I wrote that in the middle of the page, I wrote W equals F1 times delta X plus F2 times delta X plus it. Notice like I put subscripts on the Fs, but I didn't put subscripts on the delta Xs just cause what I am assuming in my mind is that I would, I would divide in my mind, I would subdivide the whole situation into a bunch of equal delta x's. It would be like a meter, a meter, a meter, a meter, or a centimeter, a centimeter, a centimeter, whatever it is, each little delta x would be of equal size, but would be small enough to have its own f value, right? Like that's the concept here. So, so all the delta x's are the same, but all the f's associated with them are different, okay? Just so you, right? So I would just add them all, and, 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 and in theory, sorry, these would be dot, these are all the dot products, I mean, I should say. They would all, I would do that vector operation that I just explained like two minutes ago, right? So, so far, hopefully so good. Like, okay, so no big deal. We can do work in a small case. And if we have a big case where we have lots of different Fs, just add up all the small cases together and get your total. End of story. Okay, that would be the end of the story. Well, well, that is nearly the end of the story. But let's let's phrase that mathematically. Um. Sorry, let's phrase that mathematically. Let's use sigma notation to write it. Now, you all remember sigma notation. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Okay, most people hate it when they first see it. But it's not as big, but don't be intimidated by it, right? The big sigma, that big capital Greek letter sigma, which is like, notice it's very like pointy, jaggedy, very, I mean, I'm not even joking. Like notice that it's very, it's a very jaggedy, pointy sort of letter. I'll explain why I care about that in a couple of minutes. Um, but what does it mean? It's just a process. That sigma is means you're going to now embark on a process. It means you're going to set a counter, like an index called I, as, as like your little counter. You're going to start it at one, and you're going to let the and you're going to go to your very first 
force, like this is again, this is what we would do if we were trying to get the total work, the total number of joules um, of work performed for a big, big process throughout a big, big delta X, what would you, if, if you had a bunch of different Fs, and again, try to picture this physically, it's like you're pushing a box over like a whole football field or something, and you're picturing a situation where in the first in the first 10 meters, you push with a certain amount and then you push stronger in the second meters and then you push stronger in the third meter, something like that, right? So what would you, so this sigma is just telling you that, okay, first, first you would walk to the meter number one where you had force value number one. I don't know if the force value is necessarily the number one, like the force value could be 33 newtons. I don't know, but it's the first force value, right? So you multiply the first force value, 33, times that 10 meters or whatever it is, right? And you put that in your bag and then you tick the counter. You now go to I equals two. You now go to the second set of 10 meters or whatever, and you multiply the second force value. You all understand what I'm saying, right? This sigma notation is just a is a shorthand for this process of going chunk number one, chunk number two, chunk number three, all the way until you get to the nth chunk, which is like the last chunk of your entire displacement, right? It's just a notation to say, add up one at a time. But the but, what are you adding up? You're adding up whatever's in that parenthesis, right? You're adding up products of dot products, in fact, of force and displacement, right? So, so far, so just bear with me or, or like kind of track this with me. Our concept here is that work is a product. It's the simple, straightforward product of force times displacement. Now we're saying, okay, but if you want to be general about that, if you want to understand work in a possibly complicated context where you have lots of different forces, the way to get it would be to add up a bunch of these products, right? In like in a pattern or in a sequence, right? So the sigma notation comes in because we're adding up a bunch of products. And why are we adding products? Because the value of each product could be changing. So we have to do more than one, right? So the sigma just means sum of, but we use that sigma it's a sum of pieces. In this case, the pieces are products. But we use this sigma notation, we use the sum of idea in cases where you can count the pieces, right? Like there's a like this isn't a case where for the where you could somehow where where you look at the situation and you say, uh oh, there's a lot of different forces involved. There isn't just one force involved. So I'm gonna have to add a bunch up. But that's like the bad news. But the good news is. Oh, I get it. Even though there's a whole bunch of different forces for this entire 100 meter journey, if I step back and look at it, if I can say to myself, oh, for each 10 meter section, there's one constant force, then I can use this situation as long as, in other words, as long as I can divide my whole into discrete, divisible, separatable, countable, you might say quantized pieces, then, then I use this notation and I use this concept and, and, and I'm just saying in the end that the whole is equal to the sum of its parts. I just add, right? This notation and this idea of adding works as long as I can find a displacement value that is small enough to, to prevent the force value from changing. I hope you understand what I'm saying. In other words, this this works. Sorry, as long as I have a situation, I know this is going to be on the next page, but I'm just going to give it to you anyway. As long as you have a situation where if I were graphing X, like if I'm making a graph where X was the X axis and F was the Y axis, right? It, force as a function of position and as long as as long as the force were increasing or decreasing in steps like like the graph i just made as long as it was like oh for the first 10 meters there's this value of force and then it jumps up and for the next 10 meters there's this other new value of force 
and then it jumps up. And it, as long as each time for each 10 meters, there's one steady horizontal constant value of force, then this whole method works and we'd be done. But maybe you see where I'm going with this. The re this is like, we're not done because realistically in the, in the real, in the macroscopic world, this is not generally how things happen. This is like a cartoon. Like if you were dragging a box across a football field, it's totally possible. It's totally, totally possible that you'd be changing your force as you walked the box. Or if you're a child pulling a sled across, you know, the tundra, right? Or, or some other child analogy that Chris will make fun of me for. But like, if you're pushing or pulling something across a displacement, which is what we're talking about here, I'm sure you can all conceive of the idea that you might well be changing your force as you displace, but probably you'd be changing your force in a smooth, continuous way, right? It's very unlikely that you'd be changing your force in a cartoon fashion like this. You wouldn't be like, okay, right you just be like stronger 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 or weaker weaker right so what we have to deal with well as it said oh okay so here it says the exact same thing so the sigma notation and procedure is used when and only when we're adding a discrete countable separable set of quantities like i just said okay this is just a repeat of what i just said um so in the case of calculating work in the physics case we could use the sigma idea to calculate work only if our displacement, oh, sorry, only if our force were changing in like steps, like I just said, and that's not the way the world generally works. So what do we do? We turn the page. The question is what, and I can go back in any moment if you want, but I think those two pages were basically repeats of each other. But what if the question is, what if force varies continuously as a function of position, right? Now that sounds like a mouthful. Oh, oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Sorry. Um, I had a feeling, yeah, no, um, um, yeah, okay, I'll pause for a second. Uh, okay, no problem, no problem. Okay, uh, yeah, okay. So the question is, what if force varies continuously as a function of position? Okay, or put it another way, what if force is varies as a continuous function of position? That's what the issue is here. Now, I'll, well, then we have to go to the limit, right? Like, like to say that the force varies continuously or smoothly as a function of position. I mean, it sounds like calculus class, right? It sounds like math class. And it is, but it means something. It, it, it comes up all the time in calculus and math for a reason. Like what I'm saying is, to vary your force continuously or smoothly means that no matter how small you subdivide the displacements in, no matter how small you make the displacement subdivisions, you're still gonna see the force changing, right? To say that the force, and that really bear, like, like follow this. What I'm really saying is that continuous means infinitely divisible. It means no matter, right? Like discontinuous step functions, quantized, or what we really call in math, ultimately discrete, a discrete function means that, e that if you step back, you're seeing the force vary a lot. Like first the force is 20 newtons, then it's 30 newtons, then it's 40 newtons. But if you look closely, if something's d varying discreetly, it means if you look closely, you can find some size of subdivision, like 10 meters and say, oh, I get it. If I divide this, like uh, if I divide this whole thing into 10 meter chunks for each 10 meter chunk, I'll have a steady force, right? That would be a step function. That would be discrete or discontinuous function. But if it's a continuous smooth function, it means no, 10 meters isn't good enough. It means you're still, the force is still varying over the 10 meters, maybe not as much, as it was over 40 meters, but it is varying. So then you go, okay, I'll subdivide to five meters. And nope, the force is still varying. So then you go, okay, a meter, a millimeter, a milli, 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 millimeter, an angstrom. And no matter how far down you zoom, you're still seeing some variation in, in force. That's a continuous function, right? Continuous, smooth, no jumps really means 
no finite subdivisions. It means infinitely divisible, right? So that means, that means we need to go, if we want to get an accurate measurement for the total work done over a displacement that is so large that it allows for variation in the force, right? It, it, right. If we want that, it means if we're going to do this process of dividing up the displacement into lots and lots of small displacements, small enough to not catch any variation in the force, then it means we want infinitely small subdivisions. So we want to take delta x to the limit as it approaches zero, right? This is where limits come in. So and I'm not saying I know how to do this yet, but I'm saying presumably this is what I want. The true definition of work in a case where the displacement is large enough to allow for continuous variations in the force, right? A case where the displacement is large enough that force varies as a continuous function of position, what we, the way we really want to define work is the limit as delta x approaches zero of sigma, of the sum of dot product of f with delta x, right? Now, now that's a mouthful. If I just wrote that down, like out of nowhere, and you looked at, or if you're like me, and someone just wrote that down for me, and I just looked at that like cold or 30 years ago, I would be like, what? I mean, I would say, I don't want, whatever that is, I don't want to deal with it. I have no idea what that's it. But if you look at it now that we've just explained all this, or you look at it in pieces, hopefully, like we went one piece at a time, right? F delta X, I'm sorry, we dealt with the F dot delta X piece. Then we dealt with the sigma piece. Now I'm putting in the limit piece. And the reason I'm putting in that limit piece is because I want to embrace the reality of force varying continuously as a function of position, well, then this would be my definition of work. It would be the limit as delta x approaches zero of that sum. In other words, it would be the sum of the force displacement products, but in a case where I've subdivided down the displacement so small that each displacement is actually as small as it can be without actually being zero, right? That's what I'm really saying. I'm saying, don't go down to the one meter level. Don't go down to the half meter level. Don't go down to the quarter meter level, but, but go down to a level. Like delta X is still some kind of difference between two values, but the difference is as small as it can be without actually making the two values one and the same value, right? That's what limit means. By the way, in science, what does that mean? Like, like, what is limit? Remember, it means just below the threshold of measurement. It means we're going to subdivide our displacement in, into subdivisions that are small enough to affect measurements. Small, I'm, I'm sorry, like large enough to affect measurements. Large enough to be there, but small enough to not register on the measuring instrument. Like, really think about that. Like, that's what a limit really means in science. It means it, 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 the limit as you approach zero means it's not zero. Like, it's there. It's a quantity that's affecting things. But it is close enough to zero that, it, that we can't give it a number, that we can't find it on our measuring instrument. That's what, okay, so that's what we're talking about here. Now I'm about to turn the page, but we're about to be interrupted by our by my favorite Pokemon drink. Here it comes. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Quick, who's your favorite starter? Huh? They, they literally asked, who's your favorite starter of all time? Uh, like the of base all... form or like the base form? Form. Yeah, not the evolved form. The base form. Froakie. Froakie. Oh, Froakie. Oh, Froakie. Oh, all right. I didn't see that one coming. All right. Good answer. Good answer. When you forget them. I didn't know. I thought you would say, I thought you would say um, a well, fire one, actually. Well, the uh, drainage anything. are so bad. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I'll rather puke on them. I'll rather, rather die than see another one. Whoa, that's a little strong. Okay, please don't die, but you can puke on them. Okay, I'm sorry you had a bloody nose at school, by the way. Okay, who? Yeah, Froakie. See, he goes back. It, it's a, what gen is Froakie? Gen five. Gen five. Okay, sorry. All right, what do you want? I mean, we're, we're, it's the sun. Oh, no. Oh, Amanda says it's gen six. Amanda said, well, okay, we'll discuss it later. Okay. I, <laughs> she, all right. Um, I'm actually shy. I think he just said that for attention. I'm sure he he likes fire. Anyway, all right. Um, 
Okay, so now we're almost somewhere. Uh, what time is it? Okay, yeah, we actually are almost somewhere. We need, yes, we. <laughs> Wait. Oh, not. He said his least. Oh, maybe he. Oh, maybe I didn't misunderstand. You might. You might be right. You might be right. Oh, not. Oh, he said it's not. Yeah, you might be right. Yeah, because he's always negative. Um, I mean, anyway. Um. Okay, so now what I'm saying is work is the limit as delta x approaches zero of the sum of, of the dot product of f with delta x. Like hopefully you're just you're still holding this in your mind. But we have a but but that's a lot of notation, right? I mean that's like a lot to say. We have a notation for that. You have a piece of notation for the limit of the sum. Or in other words, what I just wrote out here, when I took the sum of the product to the limit as delta x approaches zero. And again, don't look, don't be intimidated by, I mean, you, you can be whatever you want, but try to not let that throw you. When I'm taking it to the limit, what I'm just saying is, I'm, what am I taking to the limit? I'm just saying that instead of dividing the total displacement into a bunch of chunks, I'm now saying I'm dividing it into, I'm making the chunks so small that, and, and there, and therefore, I'm making the number of the chunks so large, right? I'm dividing to lots and lots. Let me back up even more. The whole assumption here is the more chunks we divide the displacement into, the smaller each chunk would be, and the more accurate our assessment of the entire force displacement product would be, right? Well, every time I say chunk, I mean force times displacement. And every time I say size of chunk, I mean displacement. So the whole assumption here is we're when the more the smaller you make the displacements, the more of them there are, and the more accurate this whole idea is. So when we go to the limit, I'm just saying we now make the chunks so small that they're infinitely small. So there's an infinite number of them. They're all like attached to each other rather than actually countably distinguished from one another. So that concept. That concept can be expressed more tidily. You might remember from the beginning, like this is beginning to sound like calculus, right? Of course it's starting to, because we're going to the limit because we're getting into the nature of infinitely small or infinitely large. Notice that what got us into the calculus, like why we're suddenly into calculus is yeah, because something's infinitely small. And the reason something is infinitely small is not be is because we have, a continuous function. It's because we're believing in reality that forces don't change like cartoon values. They don't go, eh, 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 eh. they go, eh. right? And the reason I'm saying that is like, once you have continuous function, it, 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 almost invariably, no pun intended, you start getting into calculus because continuous means infinitely divisible, right? So we have a name for the limit as delta x approaches zero. We call it dx. Remember this from the beginning of the semester and from other calculus classes when you originally first did derivatives and stuff like that. All this notation really does make sense and really does actually help. Like, like dx, I'm not saying dy dx, I'm just saying the dx part. dx means, in the same way that delta x means small but finite difference between two values, dx means difference between two values that's so small, it's not finite anymore. dx means infinitely small difference between two values. But please, it just is delta x, but infinitely close. It means the two values are still two values, but they're so close we can't put a number to how close they are, right? That's what dx means. I, just like in the case of dy over dx means infinitely small um, rise over infinitely small run, right? So it's that same dx again that you used to, you know, that we used to have in, 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 in the case of derivative. So when I, so I'm going to change, I'm going to change my delta x for a dx because that's what we're dealing with now. And when I change my delta x for a dx, I'm also going to swap out that jagged sigma, which connoted adding up a bunch of finite little chunks 
I'm not doing that anymore. I'm now adding up a smooth attached set of infinitely divisible chunks. And when I do that, when I go from the jagged to the smooth, I swap out my jagged sigma for a smooth long S, which is the symbol known as integration, right? And I, of course you've all seen this before, but maybe you haven't thought about it this way before. I don't know, I certainly had not thought about it this way until I did. Like I'm saying, what I'm trying to say, and it says it at the bottom of the page, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn the page in a second because it's gonna say the exact same thing at the top of the next page. I am saying literally, when you want the limit of, as delta X approaches zero of sigma, f of x delta x, what that whole thing is called is the integral of f of x dx. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say it like two more times in a second. But let me back up for a second and, and note one thing about, like one subtle thing is happening to the notation also. Remember, I'm, I'm now dealing with the general math concept. I'm like slightly departing from the physics for a moment to make a general math idea. I'm saying that this math of calculus is coming up because a force, capital F, hold on, let me just make this clear. So, so capital F means force as in the physics concept, right? But lowercase f here means function of as in the math concept. So I'm saying, and in fact, specifically means continuous function of. So I'm saying, as long as we believe that force is a continuous function of position, that it's changing whenever the position changes, that as long as you displace at all, you'll get a new force. If we're believing that capital F is a lowercase f function of X, then we need this whole continuous sum. And what I'm saying is a continuous sum is called an integral in math. It, um, so just notice the subtle, so I'm in math land right now. I'm writing like lowercase f of x dx rather than capital, because I'm like just trying to make a math point. And, and I'm going to flip the page and you can tell me to go back if you want, but I'm, I promise you that on the top of the next page, it's going to say the exact same thing as what it says on the bottom. Here. Oh, wait. Oh, okay. No, no, I, 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 I'm totally with Chris. I see the chat thing. I'm not even going to make a joke yet. Like that is funny. And I'm glad, like, hold that thought for, like, of course you don't. I, okay. Hold that thought for a second. Like I'm with that, but just hold it for a second. Um, what I'm saying here on the next page, yeah, okay, fair enough, fair enough. But what I'm saying here on the next page, in fact, this is now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say one more, I'm gonna, hold on. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's not the other day, yeah, okay. Uh, just... I, I'm going to write this one more time. It's going to be really clear. I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not writing this because I assume you love this. I'm writing this because I assume you don't but I think you're capable of ultimately coming to like it. I'm saying this. Now, I, I, I want you to write this down. Like, I want you to like tape this, like put this on the wall behind your bed or across from your bed or like tattoo it on the inside of your eyelid. So that every time you blink, you see this or something, ew, that's gross. But look, look, it looks like a bunch of intimidating notation, but stand back and look at it. What I'm really saying is, what is the integral? What, what does the integral mean in math? What is it? Why does it ever come up? What do we, the integral is the continuous sum of products. The integral is, you walk a little bit of X. You ask what the value of F is at where you're walking. You multiply the two together. You put it in a bag. Then you take another step along the X axis. You look up, you ask what the value of F is. 
where you're walking, you multiply the two together, you put it in your bag, then you take another step, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, when you've finished adding up all the products of the input with the output, like that's all you're doing. You're walking a little bit of input value, asking what the output value is, multiplying them together, putting in your bag. Then what? So in the case of physics, you're literally walking a meter, asking how hard the force is that's pushing throughout that meter, multiplying it. So like you walk one meter, you find that the force is two newtons. You multiply the two values together. You get two joules. You put in your bag. Then you walk the next meter. Ask how hard is the force there? Oh, it's three newtons. You multiply the meter by three. You get, I forget what the numbers are already, but you multiply those two together. You add it to what's in your bag already. And you just keep taking steps and steps and steps along, if it's physics, along literal space, like along the x-axis of space. And if it's physics, you keep asking, like, what's the force? What's the force? What's the force? But in general, force in, in physics here is just is some output value that is associated with the input value of, of meters, of displacement. So in general, in math, I'm saying whatever the function is, like, like in physics, we're assuming that force is a function of displacement, of position. But in math, I don't care whether it's about force or, or, or anything else. The point is that you take a little walk along the x-axis. You ask what the y value is, the f of x value is for that place that you're standing. You multiply the two together, throw in your bag. Then you take another step, multiply those two together, throw it in your bag, take another step, multiply the two together, throw it in your bag. And the whole total at the end is what we mean by the integral. You walk from the first value of x to the final value of x. Look at the notation, though. Like, literally look at it. The, it I never understood for years that the integral symbol is an s. It's an S, not coincidentally, because it means sum. But it's like this really smooth, graceful S, as opposed to the sigma that we used to use for sum. Sigma is this jagged, pointy symbol for sum, because sigma is what you use when you're going, when you're going product plus product plus product, when you can literally separate out the products, count them up, and think of them as discrete chunks, then you do a sigma sum, which frankly, I think most of you actually are somewhat comfortable with. So when you have sigma, you have the, the discrete sum of a bunch of products. What are the products? Input value times output value, right? If you take sigma to the limit so that the sum is no longer discrete, but in fact continuous, then you get what we call an integral. An integral is just sigma taken to the limit. An integral is a smooth, continuous sum of products, always. The, that's why the integral always has a dx or a dy or a dz or a d something in it. It's not, the d term is not there to annoy you. And also, similarly, it's not just there to be memorized and just to say, I'm always here to show you that I'm an in part of an integral. It's there because that's what the integral actually means. The integral is the sum of products of a little bit of interval on the x-axis times the corresponding y value for that x. So you... So we, okay, first of all, pause for, oh, yeah, I'm going to look in the chat. Wait, so first of all, does that make sense? Honestly? Like, okay, thank you, Ivani. Good enough for me. Okay. No, does it? Oh, oh Belina, question. Yes. Um. Yeah, I know, like, this is what you were just explaining, but I'm a little confused. Can you just explain, like, the bottom is, like, it's the sum of all the different positions. That's what we're saying. It's like the, the one on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good, and very close. It's the sum of all of of all the products at different positions of for of force times that position so let me say that even better like like it, it's the delta x the delta x part of that means a little difference in position a little step that you would take a, like like either a, like an interval a displacement not just a spot but an interval between two spots. So all the delta X's are like little meters or little centimeters or so, okay. And so what we're saying is for every one of those centimeters, you multiply by the force that's being applied at that centimeter. So it's, so what you're adding up are products of displacement times force. You're adding up. So, so I forget what, 
So yeah, all the, the things that you're adding up are all different displacements, but the actual quantity that you're adding is the product of displacement times force for each one of those little displacements. Does that make, or does that, I'm not sure if that answers your- Yeah, that does. Thank you. Okay, cool. all right, cool. So now to everybody, what's on this page that I just like made big, this is the math concept. I'm saying like the definition of the integral is the continuous sum in general of any function. The function that we're dealing with here is force as a function of position. So hold on, let me just see if I can move this back. I feel like I should be able to move. Oh yeah, yeah, see, I knew there was a way to do this. Okay, hold on, I'm sorry. Um, Right, right. So, okay. So what I'm saying, so back to this now, like, this is what I just explained. Like the thing that's on this page now is what I just said to like to Malita and everybody else. And then this is where that whole like area under the curve and the rectangles. And of course, I know you've all seen this before. I'm just, but I'm trying to give you a different perspective on it now or slightly different perspective. Like, what are all those rectangles? Those rectangles are just this, like they're, they're width times height, but the width is interval along the x-axis and the height, i.e. input, and the height is like height on the y-axis, the f of x-axis, i.e. output. Any integral ever is the sum of all of the products of input times output. And the whole idea of the integral is that if we want to actually know the full effect of the function over some interval, if we actually want to know it accurately, we assuming that the function is curvy and continuous, we'd have to divide it into an infinite number of infinitely small rectangles. Like that's what we're saying. Um, so in this case of physics, wait, so I just wrote that, right? Okay, I just wrote that. Okay, so in this case of physics, I'm just looking at the time, the function, like f of x, is force. So what we're saying here is the integral, uh, I'm sorry, the work done in general. So this is my final definition. Like this is the answer, so to speak. Like I, we haven't solved any problems with it, but this is, I'm saying two things in the end. I'm saying at the end of the day, if you wanted to deal with all the general cases, cases where force might not be parallel with displacement, cases where displacement might be too large to allow for a constant force, all the cases work in the end of the day is defined to be the integral of the dot product of force with respect to displacement. The work that I do to move, to push a box from X1 to X2, the work that I do on the box to push it or pull it from position X1 to position X2 is the integral of the dot product of force vector with displacement vector. Again, that dx really means delta x taken to the limit. Like that's what that dx means. And that integral sign really means sum, but taken to the limit. Okay, that's really what an integral is, is it? is a continuous sum of product. So you can either interpret what I'm saying to mean, if you want to understand what work is from now on, understand that work in physics is the integral of these dot products. Technically it's called a path integral. Or if you are trying still to get more comfortable with calculus, which would be many of you, and it's totally fine, then from now on, maybe whenever you're trying to think of what an integral is, bring it back in your mind to this concept of work. Like work to me is the most vivid, illustrative example of an integral that there is. Just like velocity is the most vivid, illustrative example of a derivative. And not coincidentally, because these calculus ideas were essentially invented or discovered so that we could do physics. I'm saying that an integral is a continuous sum of products as written there, wait, I'm looking at the time. Okay, yeah, I'm saying the integral is the continuous sum of products and, oh wait, I think, was I there? Right, and, 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 uh, right. and two last quick things about this and then I'll move on. One is, the reason I'm, like in a way you've all seen this before, I know that, like you've seen the rectangles and you stuff like that, but one of the reasons well, okay. Yeah, actually, let me address the Christopher and the Amanda joke. Like, like I'm totally with them. Like, the reason I'm screaming and yelling and trying to do this is, like, I chose to be a physics major, right? I chose 
to be a physics major in college. And then I went to graduate school twice after that. Okay. Like, like I supposedly wanted to do this with my life. And I'm telling you that I could not deal with integrals for years. Like, I mean, I could deal with them the same way you, like I sort of gutted through, but I knew I didn't understand integrals. I, I, first I ignored them. I tried to run away from them. Then I tried to fake my way through them. That like, I went through all the stages, <laughs> denial, anger, grief, bargaining, whatever. Like, I, I, I mean, I am not exaggerating. Like I sort of got derivatives at some point. I did sort of get derivatives at some point, but for certainly when I was a student, integrals, I knew anytime an integral came up, up. my i was like i'm out um I, I just figured they were talking to other people and let me be more specific generally speaking whenever an integral was going to come up in a class um they always started with something like assume that f of x is a continuous function on the interval from x1 to x2 like they would always start with something about continuous function and i'm telling you that the minute i heard the word continuous function my brain fogged and i was like this is the part where they start talking to other people in the room Cause like, I don't even know, like they're always saying continuous function. And to me, that was like code for, we're going to get very mathy now and really specific. I'm So I can relate, like I hated it forever. And I even thought that I liked physics at some, some level, but I'm telling you, it is ultimately likable. It, this stuff ultimately, like you have to practice with it. You have to sit with it. You have to think about it. You had to see it more than once. No one, like you, you had to just keep going back and forth between the math class and the physical class. And you can't expect it to come instantly and neither should professors, honestly. But one thing you do want to do to help yourself get this material is keep the faith. Like don't run away permanently and do assume this is a mistake I made was all these words actually do mean something in English. Every time they said continuous function, I thought they were basically secretly telling me to leave the room because now the club was going to have a meeting. But what they were actually saying was that calculus is about to come up because we're about to deal with something that is infinitely divisible. They're actually saying that you need calculus when things are smooth because when things are smooth, change happens at infinitely small steps. Okay, so like it, it, when you really think about it, it really starts to make sense, um, I, I think. Um, um, the other, oh, quick, well, I'm looking at the time. The, 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 but the other thing, not to be more technical or to more substantive, there's another reason that people get lost in integrals. And most people have that one way or another, there's more discomfort with integrals than with derivatives. Like if you, like that's common, very common. Part of the thing that happens, there's a number of reasons for that, and they're all legitimate. But one thing that gets confusing with integrals to people is that we you tend to hear something about integrals being anti-derivatives. I don't know if that rings a bell, but perhaps some of you in the room has have heard of anti-derivatives or right. Okay, thank you, Chris, for the okay. Yes. So look, that's not wrong. That's like totally right. And we're going to get into that, but let's be clear. They like that gets confusing fast. I'm telling you, triple equal sign what an integral is. What it is, is a continuous sum of products. What I haven't told you yet is like how we solve it, how we do it, which of course you do a lot of practice in that in your math classes. None of what I've said so far is how to do it. What I've said is what it means and why it ever comes up. The reason that gets lost, in the, and that's very important, right? But the reason that gets lost in the shuffle for people is it tends to be the case in math classes that we get very quickly down to the business of how do you solve integrals? And the way to solve integrals, what they turn out to be double equal sign, the double equal sign aspect of integrals is that it turns out that in order to solve them, there's this major discovery that we make called the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says that if you want to solve an integral, it turns out often you can do a derivative backwards to solve an integral which is crazy in itself. I mean, that's very exciting and weird in itself, but it turns out that if you're good enough at doing derivatives and you can do them backwards, if you could do an inverse derivative, if you could do an anti-derivative, it turns out that that will give you the answer to an integral in a lot of cases. So it turns, and that's very useful and, and that's very important. And of course it's emphasized in math classes, but I'm saying, be very careful. The, in, it, that, the reason that's a theorem of the fundamental theorem of calculus is because it's not a definition. That's a discovery that in order to do integrals, we often do derivatives backwards. 
But if you get really caught up in that, it's really easy to lose sight of what the integral was in the first place. In the first place, an integral is not defined to be an antiderivative. That's not its definition. And I'm not disagreeing. Like everything I'm saying is in agreement with everything your math teachers are saying. Like I'm not, but I'm just emphasizing something that you can do deriv um, integrals by doing antiderivatives. But what they are and why we ever set them up or why we ever use them, what an integral is, triple equal sign at its base, is a continuous sum of products, okay? It involves a dx, a differential, but in and of itself, there's nothing about derivative. There's no slope with the tangent line here. It is the continuous sum of products. Now, oh, okay. I don't even, well, thank you. I don't even know if that was motivational or not, but okay, thank you. Yeah, um, all right. So cool. So that was my motivational speech. So that, all right, now, um, I always get, I'm, I'm the worst at taking, I never, it's probably, okay, okay. So, so that's, that's what work is now. Very, now I have to get to some physics double equals. There's, there's, there's very little left of the lecture, but um, now comes the question, so who cares? Like, fine, so I'm trying to explain what integrals are, I'm trying to explain what work is as an integral, but why do we need work in physics in the first place? Uh, in other words, what work is, is the path integral of force. But what is what does work do in physics? What's the double equal sign consequence of physics of work in physics? Well, here, here's how we do it. In order to find out, we're going to examine the consequence of network. Like we're going to think about for, a, for like nine minutes. We're going to think about a box or, so, or a sled or something that is subject to many forces at once, but all simple constant forces acting over small intervals, we're going to think if there's a box that has a bunch of forces acting on it and it gets shoved through some displacement. In other words, if we have a box that is subject to some net force pushing or pulling it through some displacement, I'm going to ask, what's the consequence of this net work that is done on the box? Like, what difference does it make? So, so I'm going to the small case now. I'm going back to the small delta x case for which force is essentially a constant. I can do that now. If I want to analyze something, I can do that because everything we just did with the integral and all that just sort of established that if you, what we just established is if you want to analyze the whole, you could break it up into the sum of its individual parts, right? That's what we're, that's the purpose of all this. So if I want to make an analysis now, I can analyze any one of the small parts and then just add them all up and whatever I just found to be true will be true for the whole thing. So I'm going to make my life easy and analyze one of the small parts. I'm going to ask myself, what happens when I apply a net force to some small displacement, right? Like that, I'm, I'm asking this down here. Net work done uh, throughout some small displacement will be net force times that displacement, right? Well, net force equals MA. I mean, Newton's second law, F net equals MA. So the net work on, on something is MA times delta X. But now we spent all this time at the beginning of the semester analyzing A, doing all these concepts and derivatives and equations with uh, acceleration. Um, and we have a bunch of different ways to express A. And we have one of them, one and only one of our equations from the beginning of the year expresses A for situations where we don't know anything about the time and we don't care anything about the time. And that's the situation we have here. Remember, work, what work is, is the effect of force throughout space. Work is what is the force accomplishing through space, not through time, through space. So I'm going to use the one equation that ever relates acceleration to space and leaves out the time entirely. And that equation you may or may not remember. The equation is... Sorry, where did I write? The equation is here at the bottom of the page. A equals V squared minus V naught squared over 2X, or the way I'm writing it right now, 2 delta X. Same thing, right? Like X meant displacement at the beginning of the semester. And right now I'm being very, very careful to, um, to highlight the fact that it's a displacement, not a position. So I'm writing delta X. It's the same thing. So the equation from the beginning of the semester that I want here is V squared minus V naught squared over 2 delta X equals A. I'm substituting that in for A, V squared minus V dot squared over two delta X, okay? And again, don't get 
freaked out by the deltas. So I substitute that in. I say that the net work done equals MA. In fact, I'm going to make this clear. I, I'm writing the exact same thing that I just written. Yeah, I'm writing, don't, don't worry. I'm writing the exact same thing. I'm saying that net work done on an object equals And I'm crossing out the delta x's. So I'm saying then apparently net work done on an object equals that, or and put another way. Okay, now remember, so so I just did a little bit of algebra and just showed that when you do work, the network that you do on some object, on some mass, equals 1 FMV squared minus 1 FMV not squared. Like, what is that? Well, remember, anything minus thing not, like, like remember, X minus X not means change in X, change in position, what we call displacement. Or V minus V naught over T means change in velocity over time, what we call acceleration. Whenever you have a quantity minus the initial value of that quantity, that always means change in that quantity, difference in the value of that variable, right? Well, so here we have that same thing. We have 1F MV squared minus 1F MV naught squared. So what is that saying? It's saying that when you, now this is a discovery that we just got from algebra, but it's saying if I do work on an object, if I do three joules of work on an object, three joules of positive work, I push it and I move the object like, like a certain number of meters, evidently, according to this equation that we just discovered, and I know there's three minutes left, according to this, apparently, like, it's not some simple thing like that when you push the object through a three meter displacement or something that the speed goes up by three, or it's not a simple thing like the acceleration goes up by three. It's not simple like that. But apparently if you do three joules of work on an object, something does go up by three. It, apparently, according to this, if you do, or if you do seven joules of work, positive work on an object, then something goes up by seven. What goes up by seven? Well, this weird thing, this is what goes up by seven. Evidently, if before you start pushing, you take the speed of the object at that moment and you square it. And then you multiply that by the mass of the object at that moment. And then you divide the whole thing by two, right? Like you take measurements, like how big are you? How fast are you going? Okay, you're going this fast. I'm going to square that. Then I'm going to multiply by how big you are. I'm going to divide the whole thing by two. If you take all those quantities together and make that package of one half the mass times the square of the speed and you write it down, and then you do work on the object. You like push it through a displacement and say you do like seven joules of work on the object. When you're done, and then you take a new measurement of how fast it's going right now at the end instantaneously, square it, multiply it by its mass, divide by two. And you look at that whole package of quantities again. If you compare the two package of quantities, you'll find that that whole package of one half the mass times the speed squared will have changed by exactly the seven joules of work that you did. That quantity, in fact, half mass speed squared, if you think about it, is measured in kilograms times meters squared divided by seconds squared, kilograms times meters per second squared times meters, in other words, which is newtons times meters. It's joules. I'm, I'm speaking fast because I know it's like one minute, but what I'm saying is to do work on something is to change its one half mass speed squared value. Now, that's very awkward to say, but it's very important to note 
because this path, I would have never cared about one half the mass times the speed squared before. I've never thought it had any significance before, but evidently it's the package of measurements that changes exactly and precisely and predictably according to me doing work. So we give that package a name from now on because it's so important to track. From now on, that package, what, what we otherwise could have called the half mass speed squared is from now on called kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is your one half mass speed squared description. Kinetic energy is what is changed when work is done on you. What this says, and of course, I'm going to elaborate more on this, like in the next few class, you know, like next Monday. But what this is, this is called the work kinetic energy theorem. It's I'm literally here. I'm not assuming. I know you've all heard of kinetic energy before, but this equation isn't assuming that. Like this is where kinetic energy comes from. I'm saying from now on, when you do work on something, you change the something's kinetic energy. In fact, specifically, when you do work on something, you transfer kinetic energy to it. Work is the transfer of kinetic energy. What is kinetic energy? It's the ability to do work. Is that a circle? Yes, it is. It's literally like saying money is the ability to spend money, right? A transaction is when I give you money. Why do I want a lot of money? So I can do a lot of transactions. The more money I have, the more money I can give away in transactions. That's what's going on here. Energy is the ability to do work on something else and thereby give it energy, give it the ability to do work on something else. That's that's what the and energy is one F M V squared. Obviously, we'll talk more about that on Monday, but that's the class. I will hang out if there's any questions, but you've been very, very kind. Um, we will have time to do the course evaluations during class next week, but if you do have a chance to do them before, that'd be great. But we'll we'll have, but please do them one way or the other, but we'll have a chance to do them. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Um, have a great week. Uh, yes, bye. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. Good. Yes. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. cool. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank you. I will find a picture of the dog, Michelle. I will. Uh, I mean, at some point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Bye.